Today, we're going to briefly look at and discuss a series of sonnets by the same author of the play that we analyzed on Tuesday, Alfredo Testoni. And then we, spend, we will spend the rest of the lecture looking at a series of short silent films on the automobile, talking about the genre as it was introduced during that time in theaters. This is a complete, completely different kind of film. And of course, some of these films are short, very short, two minutes, two to five minutes often. Of course, they would be combined with either other films when people went to the theater or live shows, right? In 1908, this is the presentation that I'm using and that you find under week seven. In 1908, in September, on over, over two days, a Sunday and a Monday, near Bologna, a major northern Italian town, there was a race, two races. Uh, on, on the Sunday, they had the, the actual race cars, and on Monday, they had a race on the same racetrack with stock cars. It was an international event. It attracted a lot of people from Bologna and the surrounding area, press coverage. And what you have here is a map with the actual racetrack. Bologna, the area of Bologna is here, more or less. And when you go to the wiki of the class, to the page for this uh, group of readings, you will find also a Google Maps where you can see that the roads used for the racetrack are still there. It is typical as a racetrack of the style of the design of the time. Often racetracks used actual roads and especially in the earliest part of the 20th century, fewer turns compared to modern racetracks and a lot of straights because these uh, races were about speed, showing how fast these cars could be. And these cars needed long straight to express all their power and performance. So you have a long straight out of the area of Bologna then a series of turns, another straight, a 90 degree angle turn, another short straight. You go around San Giovanni in Persiceto without crossing the downtown area, and then a long straight back to, towards the starting point, and, and you have a sharp angle, a sharp turn over there. As you can see in here, the overall length of the track was almost 33 miles. The record lap that year was by Vincenzo Lancia, who was driving for Fiat, for the Fiat team, had been driving for that team for quite a few years, but was already thinking about his own company. And in a couple of years, he would start selling cars, not only in Italy, but also in the US and his cars were known up until the 1960s for being technically advanced, for focusing on a uh, high level of engineering. Just to remind you, because Lancia as a brand is almost forgotten, in the 1950s, Lancia was racing even in Formula One. And when they retired from Formula One, I think it was 1955, uh, Ferrari bought their Formula One car to study the technical solutions used there and continued with a Ferrari that was a modified Lancia. So the uh, record lap that year by Vincenzo Lancia was almost 24 minutes to go around those 
33 miles at a speed of 82 miles, which means anyway that on the streets, these cars would travel at 120 miles or so, perhaps even faster than that. Races already had a lot of merchandise in here. You see an actual postcard that was being sold to the people going to this event so that they could write to someone saying, showing I was here, right? And, and you see some of the drivers, you see the places. This is in fact the sharp turn near Bologna, right here, more or less. Let's talk about the sonnets. Um, shortly after the race, Alfredo Testoni worked on a collection of sonnets. The sonnet is a classical structure for a poem, right? It's a poem with four stanzas. The first two have four lines each, the last two, three lines each, and, and they're supposed to rhyme in a certain way. In my translation, I translated those myself. They're not in Italian, they're in the dialect of Bologna. I was helped by a former doctoral student from Bologna to verify that my interpretation of the dialect of Bologna was correct. Um, in my translation, I didn't reproduce the rhymes uh, because it was difficult going from one language to another. What are the themes of these sonnets which talk about the race? In general, they talk about the automobile as a social trend, a social phenomenon, right? something fashionable, something that changes the behavior and practices of the people of the time. Um, if you go back to the first image, these are the four characters that you find, sometimes all of them, sometimes only two of them, or one, in this series of sonnets. The chauffeur, who has an entire sonnet devoted to him, and in the back, going from this side, you find an old woman, born in the second half of the 19th century. The name of this character is Lady Catherine, where Lady is ironic, signora, but in fact, she came from the lower class. It was someone who did simple jobs throughout its life, the character, like cleaning houses, but she has this aspiration to elevate herself and her daughter, whom you see here, Gaetana, who's not married. She has Lady Catherine this aspiration to elevate themselves, her and her daughter, socially by exploiting the youth and beauty of her daughter. If her daughter can marry someone who owns an automobile, like the man in the middle, which you can barely see, who is a marquee, an aristocrat, then they've made it in society. Yet, there is tension about this social mo mobility, and attempt at social mobility, because clearly you can be seen in a car, you can be seen with an aristocrat, and by extension, you seem to have made it. You may appear to be successful, but then you still have to play the part, right? You still have to act like someone who's moved from the lower classes to the upper classes. So these are the four characters. Lady Catherine, the old woman who was born at a time where all those technologies did not exist, with the exception of the telegraph. A young woman, Gaetana, who has been born and has grown up exactly when those technologies were occupying the social and urban landscape and attracted a lot of attention and were associated with whatever is trendy and fashionable. The car as a status symbol, the car as a symbol of elegance. And someone wealthy like the Marquis who is simply exploiting his wealth, right? His pursuing Gaetana 
because she's an easy target. Because just by offering an automobile ride, she, he, he can uh, spend time with her. And, and the aristocrat has no intention of marrying Gaetana. And we know these stories because these characters appear in a long series of sonnets. In here, I've collected the 11 sonnets of a small collection on automobilism, but there are many other sonnets, poems by Testoni where these characters are mentioned. And then towards the end of his life in the 1920s, Alfredo Testoni before dying, uh, uh, wrote a novel, the novel with the whole story of the life of Lady Catherine. And I've included a significant passage at the end of uh, this page where Lady Catherine is exactly saying what I mentioned earlier, that she was born before these technologies became predominant in society. So what are the themes that we should be looking for in reading these sonnets? Of, of course, the sonnets are comedic, are ironic, right? They're not heavy literature. But clearly, there are some themes that represent a, a thematic pattern throughout the collection. The idea that the automobile as a technology brings promiscuity and immorality, that the automobile creates a situation that is potentially morally compromising, especially for women, right? Because you create a situation where you have close proximity to a man, and of course we're talking about a single woman like Gaetana, where you may not have a chaperone, or even if you have a chaperone, when the mother is traveling on the car with them, the chaperone cannot really perform her role as she was supposed to do traditionally because of the close uh, space, the enclosed space and the close proximity created by the car, the noise, uh, etc. So overall, it's a negative representation of the automobile, although it's ironic. Okay. Keep in mind what I mentioned before, as part of this, the assumptions that circulated in the readership about human biology in general and female biology in particular. The idea that the idea that women are more sensitive to the kinds of physical, psychological, nervous stimulations that come with an automobile ride. And therefore, the idea that an automobile ride predisposes women to interact with men erotically. We're not talking about sex in the car, right? But we're talking about erotic tension. And there are a lot of references to the fashion of the automobile, how you dress, the accessories you need, uh, the various goggles, the masks, the veils, the hats. And if you want to know more, there are two beautiful uh, texts you can find online. One is by a female pioneer of the automobile, Dorit Levitt. The Woman and the Car is a book uh, she, that, that made her famous in 1909. She discusses a lot of things, not just fashion, but of course, there is a chapter on fashion. How do you dress to go and travel on an automobile? But if you want to focus just on fashion, we ha you can find online on Google Books the 1905 catalog by Sachs devoted just to automotive clothes. Uh, distinctive automobile garments and requisites and accessories. And it's 100 pages or more with pictures. The first part is chauffeurs, the men driving the automobile. The second part for about 40 pages is women and what women can wear on the automobile. And some of the accessories are weird, right? Some of the leather caps, the goggles, some of the hats are... Um, Curious, to say the least. And let's look at some of these sonnets. This is the very first, where the premise gives you a scene, the situation. The same situation that we saw from the illustrations. I took the illustrations from an Italian magazine where these uh, 
poems were first published in 1908. The situation is the Marquis has an automobile and he's infatuated, he's pursuing Gaetana to get an affair of sorts with her. And therefore, when he takes Gaetana, the young woman, for a ride, he's often forced to take the old lady, Caterina, Catherine, with them. Being seen on the automobile enhances the social status of these two women who belong to the lower classes. But, as I said before, that's not enough to be a full member of this clan, of this tribe. What's interesting about the sonnet is this idea that if you have an automobile, you gain visibility and attention, not simply because you are connected to this product, but because you are into it, because you're obsessed by it. So let's read it. For some time, we have been socializing. We is the old woman and the young woman, Caterina and Gaetana. For some time, we have been socializing with the Marquis. He's always taking us around. And without spending a dime, they're poor, I have, one could say, an automobile at my disposal. So I can go around and people will think that I'm wealthy because I have this automobile and they see me all the time on it. And now my daughter's only preoccupation is that I too, like her, learn these, those expressions, verbal expressions, that are necessary for those who hear me talk to mistake me for a true woman of the sport. It's not sufficient to be seen in an automobile. When you talk about the automobile in the experience, you have to show that you know the jargon that identifies you as a member of that clan, of that tribe, the motorists, the friends of the automobile. And so the rest of the poem tells you how the young woman, Gaetana, tries to teach the terminology, the language, the fashionable language of the technology, but the old woman is getting confused. And she, Gaetana, is giving me lessons the whole day, but I get confused between the 30s and the 40s. 30s and 40s were classes of cars. Around this time in Italy, as well as the rest of Europe and the United States, uh, cars were classified by the power of their engine. And therefore, you would have the 10s, the 20s, the 30s, which would be the approximate number of horsepowers. Between power, horses, and what have you, so much that people, I bet, are laughing behind my back. And for sure, they're labeling me an ignoramus as powerful myself as a hundred horses. You have that final punch in here. The second sonnet, which is sonnet number three that I want to read with you, is about the sensation, the feeling of speed. And then it's again about the questionable morals of single women who travel in an automobile with a man they're not engaged to because the automobile, it's a dangerous kind of situation. Me, it's still the old woman talking. Me, I just go on it to make my little girl happy. Meaning I'm not into automobiles. They're not so important. Since in her words, it is so much fun. This is a young woman, the words being repeated by her mother, talking about the experience of driving in fashionable terms. Because, as she says, it feels like flying, like being kissed by the wind. Can you imagine? And while traveling, his lord, the Marquis, the Marquis, isn't happy unless he sits in the middle between me and my daughter. There's a chauffeur in front driving, and the Marquis is in, in between the two women, and, of course, turn and guess, turning to the side of the daughter. But I swear, it's always the same story. That is to say, I end up on the side of the exhaust. She ends up on the side where you have smoke and noise, and therefore she cannot supervise this couple. And here, if they're whispering love words, inappropriate love words, the open exhaust, you know, cars from this time, were very noisy, and you can find videos 
online of unmodified cars from the period which makes so much smoke, such a smell that one cannot stand it and such a racket, my dear, that one becomes deaf. And in the middle of that, they have their conversations, their romantic conversations. But with all the smoke, the racket and the fear, I always end up not understanding a word. So I, I cannot really monitor properly what is going on. Number four is about the race. The racetrack is that trapezoid I showed you outside of Bologna. And it's about the sensation of speed and the attraction of the race. People going to the race to see the cars go by, but the cars are going by so fast that they're never there. They're immaterial. The racetrack, according to what they say, was invented by Mr. Hugo Gregurain, Gregorin was a pioneer uh, of the automobile club in Bologna to make a number of people come to Bologna and find a nice way to take some of their money. Of course, they're, they're selling products, merchandise to the people on the racetrack. It's almost like a jockey's race with automobiles. They run so fast that the Marquis, a practical man, maintains that the most beautiful moment is when one cannot see anything. But my daughter, she says that the best thing is the emotion of waiting, says, as I said, 33 miles, so there are gaps in between the cars, moments when you're just waiting for the cars to come back in front of you. An emotion that lasts for hours and hours. The, the race was actually several hours long. And after we hear screaming from everywhere, here goes Nazari, lunch is here, he's coming. Two race car drivers from the time, both uh, uh, later became car builders. Lancia, of course, was very successful. The brand is still there, although has been purchased by Fiat and is now part of Stellantis. Nazari, his brand, his company survived only less than 20 years. But as soon as they come, they are already gone, right? Speed means the cars can barely be experienced. And I've combined this with an illustration from the US, Long Island. Uh, the most famous international race on Long Island was the Vanderbilt Cup race. And this from the same period, it's uh, 1910, two years later, the representation of a spectator trying to see the cars driving by the cars involved, engaged in the Vanderbilt Cup race, right? Turning very quickly, trying to catch up with the cars uh, driving by at very high speed. And as I said, the Vanderbilt Cup racetrack was similar to the one I showed you because it had uh, very long straights, more straights than turns. Number six is a typical negative representation of the technology of the car. Can I have your attention? I, the, the, the screen is here, right? Uh, you have computers in front, but you're not typing. So maybe you can just follow. So like in Jules Verne, for example, the master of the world, there is this idea applied to the populace, the point of view of the populace, that the automotive technology is a demonic, diabolical invention. So this is the old lady, Catherine, born in the 19th century, thinking not only how she looks at the car, but how her mother or her grandmother from the first half of the 19th century would consider, would react when confronted with this technology. Maybe I'm a primitive woman meaning I'm not a modern woman like my daughter. But if you want me to speak frankly and honestly, in my opinion, that is not, uh, it is not attraction at all to see a demon with people on top, which makes an infernal noise, infernal is the key word, and gets close to you 
with a single push like a lightning, which looks like as if it's dying to jump on top of me and eat me alive. Me, I'm sure that if in my grandma's times they had come up with such a devilish contraption, they would have recommended themselves to the Lord and the Madonna. And if the idea of coming back to life in our days crossed the mind of someone from those times, that is to say, if my grandmother came back to life, they would again be dead at once from such a fright. And of course, the key word is the language of hell, demon, infernal, uh, devilish, which we found also in the Master of the World. Number seven, sonnet number seven, is also about the automobile being fashionable, being cool, and being an ideal for young people. You live trying to include technology in your life in one way or the other. These days, my Gaetana, the daughter, only aspires to a machinic ideal. The quotes are there to signify that this is the kind of language that Gaetana will use. The machinic ideal means that aesthetically, from the point of view of elegance, the machine, the technology of the car, should be a model to follow. Otherwise, life is a burden and a source of shame for all of us. Which reminds us of the lightning conductor from 1902, Alice Williamson, and how Molly Randolph sees people in England with a car and says, I felt small, right? My life is less than it could be without this product in it. And lately, no one can stand her anymore. And you know why? Because she's constantly dreaming of Nazari, the race car driver, of the time when his girlfriend kissed him in front of everybody, this is a reference to the race in Bologna in 1908, as soon as he arrived and was awarded the Bologna Cup. So he won the cup, and it's true that Nazari always traveled with his uh, fiancée. Um, her family was not so happy that she had picked this man. Um, and, however, so far I haven't found any articles confirmed confirming that they kissed in public which was considered by many still inappropriate at that time and that's not all what is worse is that those damned automobilists with their glasses resemble each other so much and she the daughter having a sentimental frame of mind this idea that women are so sensitive and therefore easily tricked or influenced and being rather short-sighted, she sees Nazari in every man who's wearing glasses. So whenever she feels someone who's driving an automobile, she thinks of Nazari simply because she cannot see their face. And, and that's the ironic representation of this idea, the danger, the promiscuity of the car. Number 10 is the sonnet about the chauffeur that I mentioned when I was talking about the lightning conductor. If you could see the chauffeur of the Marquis, how much is bragging? The chauffeur is a professional in demand. Someone who can make money, someone who uh, is the subject of headhunting. People are trying to snatch good drivers from one another, offering them higher salaries. So the chauffeur represents social mobility. And the ironic representation of that is that this particular chauffeur used to be a student, a school of medicine, medical school student, but left because you can make more money as a chauffeur. And the final joke will be you can kill more people as a chauffeur than as a doctor. And doctors are sadists. Right. So he's, he looks like a gentleman. Suffices it to say that he gets a monthly salary which a professor could barely get. This is the reference to social mobility. Professor, university professor, of course. And he insists on being repaid for personal expenses and wants a servant at his service. So the driver has a staff. But the reason why he has so many demands is that before he was starting to become a doctor. And he maintains, clever man that he is, 
that he turned to automobilism because he finds the sight of blood disturbing. However, it is indeed the salary, my dear. He did it for the money. And not at all the sentimental disposition because after all, he's killing many more this way. <coughs> the idea that the automobile is dangerous, that will cause injuries and deaths, uh, the death of humans and animals. And also the idea that one of the features of the technology is this subtraction of empathy. When you're driving, you're not as empathic as you would be otherwise, and therefore you may end up killing animals or humans because not being empathic makes you less careful, less cautious, and speed is addictive, right? Another, um, the last one, uh, it's, it's another sonnet about the dangers of promiscuity caused by the, the attire, by the clothes, the garments that you wear for the automobile because they mask your face and people get confused. So in this sonnet, the Marquis approaches the automobile. There is the mother, guy, uh, Caterina, there. He thinks she is the daughter and tries to kiss her. And, and she says, well, this is dangerous for, for anyone, for, for me as a woman, but it would be dangerous for any uh, woman in, in the same kind of situation, right? She might respond in kind. The woman on the automobile, look what she's wearing. Where are her eyes? Because of the goggle, goggles, you cannot see the eyes. Where is her mouth? There is a mask on the face because otherwise you get dust and, and small pebbles. You can't see anything anymore. And being that you don't know who she is, something inconvenient ends up happening. I was ready to go the other day with a scarf and the glasses when I realized that his Lord the Marquis was coming close to me and then he hugged me without so much as asking. I told him, so rude, who do you think I am? And he, looking at my face, all surprised, he ran away like a beaten dog. He's disgusted. And I didn't say anything more out of prudence, but just think what disaster might have happened if I had been one of those women who feel free to get friendly. So women and automobiles is not considered a good combination. This is just one other sonnet, not from the same collection, from a previous time, about the same group of characters. And here too, you have the mother, the daughter, an aristocrat. And the issue is who's checking on what they're doing? Who's escorting them to make sure they're not doing anything inappropriate since they're not engaged? <coughs> not not married and not engaged to be married yet. My daughter, who has a sort of attraction for autonobilism, this is a pun, play with words that is inscribed in the original, autonobilismo, where you have automobilism and nobility fused together to say that on the automobile you seem to, be, to belong to the upper echelon of society. The other day, conversing with a chauffeur, is that how you say it? Chauffeur, during this time, was anyone, depending on the context, could be anyone driving a car, whether a professional driver or the owner of the car, immediately got fired up about going for a ride. And so out of prudence, I said to them, as long as there are at least three people, meaning the couple is not alone. There is another adult there. But of course, this is the daughter response. We are going, she replied to me, with Isotta Fraschini or Fiorenza. And this is the joke in the sonnet. Isotta Fraschini was a brand known for elegance. Some of the wealthiest people in the world around this time, from American, American and European millionaires to kings uh, in, in Asia, uh, would purchase Isotta Fraschini or have custom-made bodies placed on Isotta Fraschini. But Isotta, the name of the company, is also a woman's name. 
Fiorenza, uh, the actual name of the company was Florencia, but again, Fiorenza is an Italian female name. So she mentions the names of the car since they are names that coincide with female names. The mother thinks that there is a woman traveling with them. And I, believing that those were ladies, not cars, I gave them permission to go riding away. But you might imagine my sorrow later on when I came to learn that they traveled back and forth by themselves, the two of them. How could I ever imagine that those contraptions are called with the names of women? And just quickly, I left this in the original so that if you have any familiarity with Italian, you can appreciate how different this language is, the dialect of Bologna, compared to standard Italian, right? And the pronunciation is, of course, different. The phonetic system is different. I just want to translate for you the last line on this screen in the second stanza, which is, again, a line that is attributed to the daughter who plays the part of the modern woman. And she says in this poem, l'elettrico fa vivere più in fretta. Using Italian, as opposed to the dialect, the, the populist, populist dialect, uh, the popular dialect of the mother, she uses Italian to say this, this because it's more appropriate for this motto, which encapsulates modern life. L'elettrico fa vivere più in fretta means electricity makes you live faster, right? The idea that speed is the main quality of modern life, electricity is the best incarnation of this idea because electricity travels on the wires very quickly. We talked about the telegraph at the beginning of the semester, but speed is everywhere in modern life. And if you're not experiencing this new dimension, then you're not living. Then you're not a member of your generation. You're not a, a full citizen of the new century. Okay? And this is the part about silent films. Uh, we'll look at several of them. Keep the following in mind. Many of these can be classified as trick films. Because... For a long time, at least until the 1910s, silent films were not about the story, the arc of the characters. There, there was a story, a rudimentary story, but the characters are barely defined. And the most important feature, what attracts people, what makes people go to the theaters and see these films, are the tricks, meaning the special effects. The special effect is really the core element of many of these silent films. You have to keep that in mind. There is also the element of comedy. Even when you have a semi-tragic situation, we'll see, uh, the next to last film that we'll see, it's never completely dramatic or dramatic in a modern sense. There is always an element of, of comedy. When it comes to the special effects, you find all kinds of them. Uh, cars can be used, real cars, but otherwise they can be replaced by model, miniature cars, or even a profile, a cutout of a car made of wood. And it's rudimentary, right? But cinema has developed, has gone through stages in terms of special effect, even when you look at computerized effects from the 1980s and 90s, they appear to be quite primitive to us, right? Editing is the key stylistic technical feature in these films because in order to make the tricks work, you have to really be good at editing. I'll show you in a moment with the first film what I mean. And the main... Uh, uh, strategy to make these films exciting is the stop trick or substitution splice in modern terms you can click and, and read more about it basically it's this technique where you film a scene then you stop the scene when you stop the scene everyone has to be perfectly standing 
No one can leave the scene, the actors, you cannot move anything. You replace one or more objects in the scene. You may replace the characters. And then you continue and you attach these two pieces of films, these two sequences, to have one sequence that is seamless or looks seamless. Because by doing this, if I stop the video of this class and then a colleague of mine comes and takes my exact position and then I edit it, it looks like I'm disap I've disappeared and someone has magically appeared or that I've transformed into something else. A lot of this takes place. Superimposition is another trick whereby you have, uh, you can project a film and then have a scene in front of it, fake backgrounds, etc. Stop motion, still used on YouTube by plenty of people, is when you have a puppet or let's say a miniature model car, you take one picture, you move the car, you take another picture and you move it slowly by very small fractions of space and then you combine all those frames to have the model move by itself. And you'll see these cars going over the mountains, in the air, in the sky, etc. Uh, the backgrounds, the props, are clearly theatrical. They're not cinema-like. Uh, it's, it's really the fake backgrounds, the simple props that you would often find on the stage. And the style, of course, is quick, right? Things tend to happen quickly, right? And amplification is typical, meaning that Every joke is expanded uh, to death. The first examples we'll see don't have anything to do with the car, but it's just to show you how in, at, at the very beginning, the, the first one is 1901, the second is 1903. Even before you see cars in these films, the style was already there. And then this style was adapted to films with cars. So the first one uh, that we will see called Undressing Extraordinary from 1901 was directed by a magician. So a magician is used to tricks and it's not the, the only one who was a British magician but there is at least another director from the time who was a magician and turned to this uh, business. Um, and Undressing Extraordinary is the story of someone who goes back to his bedroom completely drunk and he's undressing because he's tired, drunk, and he wants to go to bed. But every time he's trying to, he's close to the stage of undressing where you could then put on pajamas and go to bed. Magically, he gets new clothes on top. And in terms of editing, it's done very precisely, very seamless transformation from one a uh, set of clothes to another. It's very quick. And you can find all of these films on YouTube. There it is. Some of these have music. In other cases, we don't have the original music. And you see, it's just a sequence, the same kind of situation. And it's almost obsessive, right? You, by the end, you feel for the guy. But look at how carefully edited this is. Look at the crude background. As I said, very theatrical, very fake. And it's all obtained by stopping the actor, dressing him up, and placing him again in the same exact position. And people would just laugh and enjoy the visual magic of the scene. And as I said, they would either watch a series of these, not two hours of these, or these would be combined with live performances by comedians, by singers, hybrid theater 
was a thing during that era. It goes on and on. Amplification. This is a good example of it, right? Because there is no real variation. It's the same pattern repeated over and over and over again. He gives up. Finally, the right kind of clothes. And magically, the apparition of a skeleton, which is topical for that time. There are many stories of people who go to the bed and find a skeleton, find surreal magical stories were very popular and of course it's a memento of death going to bed going asleep aligned with the idea of dying and more and more and more of the same in terms of narrative pattern and the next one is interesting because both use the same situation as the inspiration for his first film with an automobile. Only this one, which is very short, The Extraordinary Cab Accident, has a carriage, a carriage with a horse, going over someone. And you can see clearly that there is an actor that at some point is replaced with a puppet, but through editing, through the stop trick, the execution is quite smooth. This has some music, but you never know whether the music is original. This seems to be generic. Here comes the carriage. And of course, it's trampled over. And you don't see when it's replaced with a puppet. Then he comes back now, it's the actor again. It seems tragic, it seems dramatic, but it always ends up in comedy. Look at the props, even the moustaches are so fake. enough for the time and now we see the automotive version of this uh, let me just put this as an introduction first so you find the same kind of accident at the beginning of the question mark motorist it's actually called the question mark motorist 1906 at the beginning you have a couple going for an automobile ride there is a policeman trying to stop them because they're speeding and they run over the cop and then of course they become fugitives because they've committed this crime and they escape but their escape turns into a fantastic surreal magical escape from reality the car goes up a building, goes in the air, goes into the skies, up to Saturn, goes on the rings of Saturn, comes back, crashes through these clouds and into the, a building where there is a trial for another automobilist. Right? And, and there is no real point to this. Rather than this magical representation, the representation of the car as a magical technology, the idea that the car can go anywhere, like in Jules Verne, the master of the world. The idea that if you're in a car, no one can really reach you. That the car separates, allows you to get out of any situation. And that the car redefines reality as its own ecosystem, right? If you take an urban or a natural landscape and you place a car in it, nothing is normal anymore. And being on the car, the journey as a dimension, right? 
subclass elements are present, right? This can be is is afforded by your your wealth, uh, the fact that you can you can purchase this expensive technological products, you can enjoy all those advantages. The same director in 1911, given the success of his previous short films about the automobile, made the automatic motorist. Automatic because it's about a car driven by a robot, by a humanoid uh, made in a steampunk way with cogs, cogwheels, um, and driving a couple, a couple that just married, to a kind of honeymoon trips that turns fantastic. They'll go again into the sky, they'll have their adventure in the sky, uh, in the stars, they'll go back to the bottom of the ocean to see creatures there, and there you'll see the example of the superimposition where actual creature, live creatures, are superimposed with two rolls of films over the automobile and the actors. And then, while they're flying again, they'll be shot down by the hunter, by hunter, and come to the ground. So, the story doesn't really hold water, it's comedy. It's this magical idea of the technology. The next one is one of the first films about the automobile, and by far the most important in this first period of the history of cinema done by a pioneer of cinema, the inventor of many techniques for films, how to make a film, how to develop a film, a, a pioneer and inventor in the field of special effect. His name was Georges Méliès. Méliès. Um, and he was producing a lot of films, often one per week, uh, even though it would take him a long time not to shoot the film itself, but to edit the film, to add the tricks to the film. And we know that he produced, for the first 20 years of the 20th century, hundreds and hundreds of films. However, many of them were destroyed during the war, when the government burned the film to recover some of the chemicals in the film, and more of the films that survived were destroyed by Méliès himself in the 1920s when he lost his company because he has signed a, a, a contract with a big company that exists even today, Pathé, that the contract forced him to produce so many films that he couldn't really deliver all these films and uh, because of clause in the contract he lost his own company before they came to get all the stuff from his studios, he destroyed at least 200 films. So there are some that have survived. Even this one is not complete. We don't have all the scenes. We have nine of the scenes. The original film either had 10 or 12. And it's called in English, An Adventurous Automobile Trip. Originally, it was a hybrid show, meaning that some of the scenes were performed on a stage with actors and other scenes were shown on the screen. Usually the beginning and the end done with actors, the core scenes with films. Then the show was so successful that at the end of 1904, he made it into a film and the film was colorized something he did often, but colorization during that time mean, meant that you had on every frame, you have to apply color by hand. So a lot of labor, very expensive, very time consuming. And he distributed the film in the United States as well, very successful. And sometimes they would still have some live performance connected to the film itself. Uh, there are references to current events and stars and celebrities. For example, the protagonist is a king, King Leopold II of Belgium. There is a reference to the application of tar to the streets of Monaco. In the first scenes, there are actors, uh, circus performance, other uh, performers, other celebrities. 
and for the uh, performance, the hybrid performance, they would for Paris use the this this place that still exists, the Philippe Berger. Um, the scenes are shot inside the studio, inside the theater, and some were shot in the gardens outside the house of the director. There is a very clear pattern. This is a description of all the scenes that are left. As I said, the original had 10 or 12. This is what we have, but you can read this at home. There is a clear pattern that you will see in every scene, and, and it's the following. The setting of the scene, normal, peaceful, productive people, social and commercial activities going on. The car arrives, attracts the attention of the people. Disruption follows, and disruption continues after the automobile has left the scene, and usually they use the fade or dissolve effect going from one scene to the next. 